the Harvard Graduate School of Education, working at the nexus of practice, policy, and research. Well, this is a pretty proud day for the Harvard Graduate School of Education. Thank you for being with us and joining in this celebration. Um, I'm Kathleen McCartney, Dean of the Harvard Graduate School of Education, and I have the honor of welcoming you to this special Ask With Forum. This afternoon, it is my distinct pleasure to award the Harvard Graduate School of Education Medal for Education Impact to Jeffrey Canada. You can see the medal right there. Our medal honors an educator who has made an outstanding contribution to the field. An educator who has advanced our mission to improve student opportunity, achievement, and success. This is our highest honor. In recognizing Jeff, we honor a trailblazer whose passion for education equity has inspired a generation. He's a visionary who saw a need and built an organization to meet it. He's an innovator who created a solution that others strive to emulate. He is a leader who has inspired others with his tireless advocacy on behalf of children and families. As Secretary of Education, Arne Duncan has said, and I quote, each day Jeffrey Canada is driven by a deep belief that all children can succeed regardless of race, wealth, or zip code. Jeff began his higher education at Bowdoin, where he studied psychology and sociology. Soon thereafter, he arrived here on Appian Way, where he earned his master's in education in 1975. His professional career began with leadership positions in organizations serving troubled inner youth. He became president of the Reedland Center for Children and Families in 1990, there, he began to develop a vision for a more systematic approach to meeting the education needs of children from families with fewer economic resources. For example, his agency opened one of the first beacon centers, local schools that were transformed into community centers. By 1994, Jeff received the first ever Heinz Award in the Human Condition for his pioneering work on behalf of children in the poorest neighborhoods of central Harlem. Next, Jeff began a pilot project designed to provide comprehensive services to children and families in a single block in Harlem. This program was unique. It attempted to address the dismal living conditions, failing schools, crime, and chronic health problems that these children and their families faced. By 1997, the Harlem Children's Zone provided services to a 24-block area. Ten years later, it served a 100-block area. The New York Times called the Harlem Children's Zones one of the biggest social experiments of our time. The zone's stated goal is to create a tipping point in the neighborhood so that children are surrounded by an enriching environment of college-oriented peers and supportive adults. A counterweight to the street and a popular culture that is toxic and glorifies misogyny and antisocial behavior. Today, the Harlem Children's Zone serves that more than 10,000 children and 10,000 adults. It offers support for children and families from infancy through college, including the famous Baby College, a series of workshops for parents of children ages 0 to 3, an all-day pre-kindergarten, extended day charter schools, health clinics and community centers, youth employment services, youth violence prevention efforts, college admissions and retention support. The best part about Jeff Canada's Harlem Children's Zone is that it works. According to Harvard economist Roland Fryer and his colleague Will Dobby, Harlem Children's Zone is enormously effective at increasing the achievement of the poorest minority children. Through their research, they found that schools like the Promise Academy uh, Charter Middle School has eliminated or reduced the black-white achievement gap in math and English language arts. Roland Fryer, who is here today, wrote that it's the equivalent of curing cancer for these kids. In 2006, New York City Mayor Michael Bloomberg selected Jeff to be co-chair of a task force assigned to significantly reduce poverty in New York City. 
Later that year, the New York City Center for Economic Opportunity was established to implement the solutions Jeff helped to engineer, like expanding universal pre-kindergarten to three and four-year-olds. But Jeff's advocacy has not just touched the lives of children and family in New York. In 2009, President Obama announced a plan to replicate the zone in 20 other urban areas. Planning grants have already been awarded to five communities. I suspect many of you have seen the award-winning documentary, Waiting for Superman. If so, you know that Jeff has had a starring role, and for good reason. Jeff and the Harlem Children's Zone have also been featured on countless television programs, ranging from 60 Minutes to The Oprah Winfrey Show. And last year, Jeff was named to Time Magazine's Time 100 list of the world's most influential people. Jonathan Colzall called Jeff one of the few authentic heroes of New York and one of the best friends children have or ever will have in our nation. Jeff, we give you this award in recognition of your powerful writing in books like Fist, Stick, Knife, Gun, in recognition for your advocacy for children in Harlem and beyond, and in recognition for your vision for a more just and equitable world, please join me now in welcoming Jeff Canada. Wow. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Nice. That's nice. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Please. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, it is. It is so good to be back home. Uh, I uh, have spent a um, wonderful uh, part of my development here uh, on Appian Way, uh, and and I was telling Kwame, who uh, is uh, here at the uh, business school and Kennedy School, who's going to come work with me, that. When I, when I got here in 1974, right, I came to the Harvard Graduate School of Education. I said, so where's the campus? They said, <laughs> some of y'all are feeling me right now, right? They said, it's here. I was like, was it around the corner over here? It's like, like no, it's right here. Uh, I, had, I had no idea uh, that this was going to change my life, right? So this is, I don't usually, talk about this part of my career. But uh, in many ways, there have been powerful forces uh, shaping my own career. Uh, and a lot of those forces uh, sort of came together right here. And they were, they were just uh, too far apart to come together for it to be an accident. And so uh, the first thing you have to understand is uh, I, I wanted to be a psych major and a uh, social major, we didn't have education at Bowdoin as a major, because I was trying to put together a constellation of supports that I thought would save children like myself, right? This was a personal thing. I knew these kids, I was one of these kids. I felt like we could have made it, most of us didn't make it, and I, I thought that there was something about education and psychology uh, and the sociology going around that was destroying us. And I said, I'm gonna go to a great school and figure out what this thing is. And so I wanted to study psychology because I, you know, I was a big fan of sort of, you know, the TV version of clinical psychology, right? Freud, ego, id, super ego. I knew something your mother did back when you were a kid really messed you up. And we could trace all that stuff, right? And I could sit back on the couch and, you know, but I, I didn't do my research. Bowden didn't offer the clinical stuff. It was all learning theory, right? It was all learning theory, learning. So I go through, I do my four years of learning theory. I don't know what to do with this stuff, right? It's a lot of data and research and studies and stimuli and response and all this. Ah, ah, great. I don't know what to do with it, but I'm doing sociology, I'm doing education. And then I thought that it was a part of my uh, educational development that I hadn't paid attention to. And it had to do with what was happening inside the body. Right? That I knew that there was things happening inside the body because I could feel it. You ever been really scared? You knew something happened to you, right? And we spent a lot of time scared, 
Uh, people were using lots of drugs and alcohol, and I thought it was, I didn't know the term self-medication back then. But I could see it in friends and family that the world was so out of control that the only time people felt good was when they were using some substance. And I was, so I took a pharmacology class, and I took a physiology class when I was at Bowdoin. Now, I'm a senior. These are like the hard sciences, right? You know, they're a little arrogant sometimes in the hard sciences. Not for you social science education kind of guys. And I got A's in both of the classes. And after I got A's, the professor came to me and said, Jeff, Jeff, you got an A, pharmacology. I said, yeah, that was great. He said, no, no, no. You understand what that means? I said, well, what? That you're smart. Now I'm a senior. I've been getting A's in lots of classes, right? I'm getting, but no, no, he said, but then you got an A in physiology. They said, well, you, you need to become a doctor. I said, why? They said, because you're smart. You're smart enough to do it. You can get A's in these classes. You get A's in the, in the sciences. They said, now here's one problem with education, right? So you hear what they're saying now? I'm 22. I got these folks, they all have PhDs. They brought the dean. They brought the chair of the science department. They said, no, no, he's not understanding this. Jeff isn't getting this. He's going to waste his life on education. We, we got we to gotta convince him, right, that he is too smart to waste his life going into education. And they sat me down. And they, they, just, they just started explaining this to me over and over and over again. And I was meeting with Roland and his team this morning. This is true. I shouldn't probably tell you, but this is true. So when they weren't getting me with anything else, they said, did you ever think about the nurses? Right? And I was like, <laughs> <laughs> I must admit that began to sway me a little bit at that time. Right? I just, I'm 22. Right? What am I thinking? And I decided I listened to them. They convinced me. I decided I was wasting my time with education. I was going to go and become a medical doctor. And I had to go take extra classes and everything else. And then a very funny thing happened. I realized I didn't want to be a doctor because I didn't like sick people. Right? Why would you do something that you actually, well, you know what? You know what happens every day uh, that uh, folk uh, denigrate what it means to be able to go in and help young people. Uh, and you know, that's not the way it is in, in other countries in the world. Uh, but there is this sense that folk who come into this business aren't serious. So I got over that. And I wanted to go to the most serious place I could, right, to continue my education development, right? So I'm looking, I'm look and so I come here, probably for the same reason a lot of you came here. I come here, I'm like, yes, I'm serious about this thing. But I got here. And I wanted science. I wanted to know for real what it would take. I had, I had done my time. I had spent my time in psychology, sociology, spent my time understanding the body. And now I needed somebody to tell me what to do, right? Because I felt like if I just could get it, I thought I was smart enough. Right? I thought I was, was dedicated enough. I just didn't know what to do. Uh, and here is where the ed school, some stuff happened that didn't make any sense. Right? But it changed my life forever. So the first thing that happened was it was a class in behaviorism. I'm at the head school, behaviorism. I don't really know what it is. I'm reading in the syllabus and it says they're teaching classic techniques for education using learning theory. I said, oh my God, I just spent four years learning this stuff. So I go to this class, it's run by this guy named Dr. Bruce Baker, and I go to Dr. Baker's class and I'm sitting in the back and he's talking right, about how you use behaviorism to educate folk. And he's using a science, and he's talking about stimuli and response, and everybody in the class, their eyes are clouding over, right, like, oh, God. And me, I'm sitting there saying, oh, my goodness, that stuff works. So in the middle, I raised my hand, I said, Dr. Baker, if we use intermittent reinforcement, wouldn't it make that response even stronger? And he looked at me, <laughs> and I looked at him. <laughs> And it was love. <laughs> I'm telling you, I'm, y'all think I'm kidding. I'm not kidding. Uh, so Dr. Baker believed that all kids could learn. You have to understand this. He believed that all kids could learn. He believed that almost anything could learn. He believed you could teach, uh, uh, you know, mammals things. He thought he had a technique that if you used it, the science was so powerful that you could get anyone to learn almost anything. And he had the science of background. He taught us. And then this is what changed my life. 
after we learned the stuff, I'm taking the test, I'm getting my A, I'm really excited. Then he said, you look like you know what you're doing, Jeff. He says, I want you to come with me because we're using this. I said, what are we doing with it? He says, I got this camp. Uh, and the camp is to bring the most right, disabled students, kids who have never learned, kids who can't even sit still in class, kids who are heading for institutions and some who have been let out, kids whose parents have never been able to send them to school. And we're going to take those kids away to Center Ossipee, New Hampshire. And we got a camp up there we call Camp Freedom. We're going to educate those kids. We're going to start teaching these kids. And we're going to use behaviorism to do it. I said, I'm in. I'm, we're going to teach them. Every kid, he said, every single, we're going to teach them all. So now um, we have to interview the kids because he doesn't want just disabled kids. He wants the most disabled kids we can find in Massachusetts and New Hampshire and Maine. And you have to interview to get in, right? So a kid comes in, now you have to realize who these kids are, right? Their parents are stuck with these kids because they can't go to school. The neighbors aren't going to babysit them, right? Your, your family don't want anything to do with them. So you're trapped. And we're going to take these kids away for seven weeks. Seven weeks of no Johnny, right, acting out. And so they're desperate to get these kids into the program. So they sit there at a table. We have to do a formal interview. They sit at the table and they're saying, you know, be good. Uh, and then we go through the interview and we ask questions and we talk to Johnny. Any kid who got through the interview was out. <laughs> was out, right? So here's this poor mom and she's sitting there and she's saying, no, Anthony's really good. No, Anthony, put that. No, don't pour the water down here, Anthony. No, no, Anthony, let go of my hair. He never does this. We're all sitting there. That's our kid right there. <laughs> He's getting in. So, so we, we, we screen these kids. We get kids. And this is a time in the country. Uh, I'm talking now. This is uh, the summer of 75 when I graduated. Uh, we, we, this is a time in the country that they used to take kids with Down syndrome and send them into state hospitals. They didn't believe these kids could learn. They just thought that there was nothing you could do for these kids, right? And we're taking kids who are autistic and all, and we're bringing them to camp, and we're using behaviorism. And let me tell you what the ed school was to me. So now I'm one of the instructors, because I notice I've been studying, and I can teach other kids. We get nice, smart kids from you know, the graduate schools, and they come in, we train them, and they take these kids off. We do. So every now and then, didn't happen often, there was a kid I couldn't work with. I get some kid. It was totally resistant to everything I knew. I tried every technique. We did all this stuff. And I'd go back to Dr. Baker. I'd say, Dr. Baker, I know you said that this stuff will work on every kid. Uh, but you've never met Tyrone. <laughs> and I'm going to tell you, he says, Jeff, I'm telling you the work. I said, Doc, I'm telling you, I know I'm good. I did everything you taught me. It don't work on Tyrone. We found that one kid that it doesn't work on. You know what Dr. Baker would say? He said, Jeff, we had a, we had a room, had a one-way glass. He said, get behind the glass and watch me. Dr. Baker would go in there. Within five minutes, he'd have that kid, Tyrone, sitting, focused, and he'd just look back at me, give me a little smile. <laughs> <laughs> it's like to say, and I gave you an A, right? <laughs> so you know what that did to me? Do you know what that did to me? To actually see someone who could say, watch me do it. It forever changed me. I never doubted again every kid could learn. Never doubted it again. So you can imagine my horror when I left the ed school, Camp Freedom, and I began to go into public schools. Kids had no disabilities. They weren't learning anything. People were telling me why these kids couldn't learn. I heard all of this stuff about the science of why these kids, I said, wait, 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 no, we were working with kids who were so far off the chart, people had given up on them and we got those kids. You can't tell me this kid can't sit in his chair. We can't get that kid. We had real hyper, people talk about hyperactive. People have never seen a hyperactive kid. We had real hyperactive kids. We, they talk about get them off the roof. We was getting them off the roof. <laughs> we got those kids to learn, no drugs. No, only drug we allowed folks to take, if any kids who had seizures, a lot of them took uh, Dilantin, we would have them take, but no other drugs. Uh, we, we, if, you were, if you were a hyperactive kid, you were on Ritalin, you came off the Ritalin. We did all of this with behaviorism. So I am seeing a science that is clear to me. This is not somebody's theory. I am seeing it with people. I am seeing a professor who is out there, not just teaching us in the classroom, but is there with us saying, watch me do this. 
So that's the first Harvard Ed School experience that changed my life. You can imagine when my staff come to me and they tell me why some kid's not learning. You can just imagine my reaction. You know what I tell them? You need me to do it? I'll do it. And they all look like, there he go. Here he go. Everything is, I'll do it, I'll do it, I'll do it. But I didn't, that's, that's the leadership I learned. So second Harvard Ed School piece. Uh, so now I need a job. Right? Seven weeks, I told you, it wasn't long. <laughs> it's over. I need a job. Uh, it's 75, it's in the middle of a recession. I have my master's degree from the Ed School at Harvard. I'm from the South Bronx, the inner city. I spent my whole career learning to be a great teacher. I know they're just waiting to hire me. No, they're not. <laughs> Nobody will hire me. I can't get a job. Right? So there's one group. Now, you know what? If nobody will hire you and somebody comes along and says, I have a job for you, you should be a little suspicious. <laughs> but I was young, but I was young, and I was desperate. I had a wife and two kids, and I needed a job. And they said, oh, there's this school in Boston. It's, a Jeff it's an unusual school. It's for kids who've been tossed out of public schools. I said, they've all been exercised. Oh, yeah, this was, they've been kicked out. So they, and he said, because these kids have severe emotional problems. I said, oh, I already had experience working with kids. I can do that. They said, and so you want this job? I said, yeah, I want this job. You want to teach? I want to teach. We talked about what I was going to teach. Something called the Robert White School. Now, the Robert White School uh, was started by a professor here at the Ed School. His name was John Schlein. Uh, John Schlein had spent some time with Carl Rogers uh, in the University of Chicago working out uh, client-centered therapy. And he was a real therapist. I mean, I don't know if you've, if you've ever really been to a real therapist, but John Schlein looked the role, and he acted the role, and he was the real deal. Uh, and he started a school right from here, right in Boston, took the worst public school kids in high school, and put them all in one place. And the only thing that I didn't know, this is 75, and a lot of you are young, you don't understand what's going on in Boston in 75. We were in the middle of busing. It's a court order desegregation case, got, uh, Judge Garrity, and it was very controversial. And I had never seen outright racism before until I came, this is funny, until I came to Boston. They were using the N-word, it was like nothing. Half the city was off limits. You couldn't go into Charlestown, you couldn't go into South Boston, or parts of East Boston you couldn't go into if you were black. You were just gonna get beat up. And I thought, that's their problem. Got nothing to do with me, I'm working at the Robert White School. The thing I didn't know is all the kids at the Robert White School were the shock troops for the busing controversy. So you wanna know who were throwing the bricks? This was these kids. The ones beating up all the black kids, these were these kids. They kicked them out of public schools. They went to Robert White School. So I show up my first day teaching, right? And I go in to meet my class. I tell everybody this was the teacher's equivalent of guess who's coming to dinner. Most of y'all, <laughs> most of y'all won't get that, right? I walk into class all excited. I look at the kids and I'm like, why are they looking at me like that? Right? I'm looking, there's something wrong. And they were all sitting there saying, I thought we got rid of all of them. And here he is in the classroom. Now, I'm sitting here thinking to myself, okay, it's gonna be interesting. Uh, but I've been prepared, I had a good education. Uh, and uh, John Schlein uh, was a very hands-on uh, administrator. Uh, this is, you know, this is interesting. People were great writers. John wrote wonderfully, beautifully, published that deep in the game, deep in the game. Uh, and uh, John's belief was that these young people had become so damaged through society and lousy parenting that we weren't going to be able to help them unless we could reach them. And you could reach them if you connected with them. Uh, and John, John was funny because we used to see John, and he believed that everybody needed to go through counseling. Uh, whether you wanted to or not. Uh, and we would all say that, you know, any sort of supervision session with John, you were going to be uh, psychoanalyzed. And we would say, I don't care, I'm not into that, I'm just not gonna do it. Next thing you know, he'll have you crying in there and all that, I'm not into that. 
But you know what happened? He was so good. You come in to his office. You sit down. I'm a professional. Sit down. John say, Jeff, how you doing? So I'm doing good, Dr. Schlein. How are you really doing? <laughs> no, no, I'm really good. Really? Jeff? Really? <laughs> no, I'm not doing good. <laughs> the kids are killing me, right? And you're in there, you're crying, you're carrying on. <laughs> People wonder why I provide all of these supports for my kids. Right? People think it's controversial. I say, oh, Jeff, he has social work, he has medical service. His dental service, he trying to take care of his kids. Uh, he provides, why doesn't he just focus on reading and math and what is he doing all this other stuff for? Because I found out early on in my career, this other stuff is important as human beings. It's important to all of us. Why would it not be more important to these kids who are growing up with nothing? Uh, so these powerful forces came together in my life, changed me. Uh, educators who educated, but also who hit the ground and absolutely worked hand in hand with you in the trenches on this work. Uh, and uh, I feel like what I'm doing now is a continuation of this work. Uh, so, you know, the, the idea uh, that uh, we have science in our business that folks ignore, uh, I find deeply troubling. Uh, that. Uh, anything you try to do that innovates, uh, people in our business are absolutely upset about innovation. They're upset about it. And I'm not talking about major stuff. I'm talking about little minor things. Whether or not you can have schools that can you know, be free of the regular rules and regulations. Why is that threatening to anybody? People fight charter schools. and go. I am convinced that part of the challenge we have in my business uh, is that uh, we have so demonized people uh, for trying to innovate, uh, for trying to question whether or not we should do something differently, right? I mean, you actually, you want to come in this business and do something different? Be prepared to be attacked. And that's just the way it is. Now, I know a lot of people who, uh, after a couple of years of this, they don't want anything to do with this anymore. they like, uh, why trying to do good is causing so many people to be upset with me. Uh, but I'm going to tell you, this is not for the faint of heart. Uh, doing education reform is not for the faint of heart. Uh, if, if you want to do something and you want everybody to love you, you know, become a doctor, I guess. I don't know. But don't come into education uh, because this is not about love. This is hand-to-hand -hand combat trying to save these kids. And if you're not prepared for that, I'm sorry. Now look, here's the challenge we have. I grew up in the South Bronx in the 50s. My schools in the South Bronx were the worst schools in New York State in the 50s. Today, schools in the South Bronx, worst schools in New York State. They've been bad every single year. You know, a lousy school is not like a good bottle of wine. Say 88 was a good year, right? <laughs> Don't we leave those 90s alone, but boy, those 80s were good. No, no, no. No, no, no. This stuff is consistent. Every single year is bad. Millions of children went through those schools in that period of time. Anyone who got a good education is considered, right, an anomaly. Oh, you got out? Oh, you made it? Oh, my goodness. Well, how did you do that? So you go to those schools today, right? I'm 60. They're 54 years ago. You go to the schools today, you say, so what time did school start when you were here, Jeff? Say yeah, around 8.15, 8.30, good. What time did school end? Around 2.30, 3 o'clock. How many days was school open? Well, around 180 days. How was everything taught? Oh, everything was in. Kids all lined up, they taught up here. Did it ever work? Never. Not one year. What did they change? Not one thing. How could that be? How could that be? How could you have a situation where the data and the evidence is clear? It's never worked. And what are you going to do this year? You know what's going to happen when it doesn't work this year? It ain't going to work this year. It hadn't worked for 54 years. What are you going to do in September? They're going to do exactly the same thing. Now, I don't get that. See, there's something about that that bothers me. Because for these kids, there's not a plan B. There's not a plan B. It's not like they can say, oh, OK, OK, uh, 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 PS99 is not working, uh, but I think I'm going to go to private school. 
they got no options. Uh, so I think we got to have innovation. I think we got to try some things. I think you got to do some stuff, right? That's maybe it may not work. Maybe it may not work. That's okay. I'm prepared to try some stuff that may not work because maybe it might work. Uh, and in our business, you can't try anything new. You don't want to do it. I was here in 75. Uh, it, it, it was information that came out, comes out about every five or six years, that said kids who are poor and disadvantaged, over the summer they actually lose ground, right? So you look at where the kid was in June, you see where the kid is in September, and they've actually gone down. And that data's been out forever. Name one school system that, based on that science, has said, therefore, we should stay open in the summertime. Who cares? Who cares? Who cares about the science? I don't care what the science says. We're going to inconvenience some adults? No, I don't think so. We're going to keep doing what hasn't worked, even if the science tells us something different. So you say, you know, I used to ask myself, you know, I think some of you have seen Waiting for Superman. It, it always gets a laugh. I had to see that movie uh, like 12 times, right? And you know what a sap I am? Each time I cried. I knew the plot. I knew what was going to happen. But I'm still, as soon as Daisy doesn't get it, I start weeping. Oh, God, Daisy. Kids are all good. I just tell you, the kids are all good. Uh, but in the movie, they say, and it's true, when I finished here in 75, and they said, I said, oh, yeah, I thought I was going to straighten this whole thing out in a couple of years. Right? I figured I have this whole thing straightened out by 80. 85, maybe, if I really, right? but I really believe that, right? Remember what I told you? I saw. I saw it. I saw, I saw the science, right? I got the two things together. By the way, Dr. Baker and Dr. Schlein, they never talked to one another. They were from opposite ends of the spectrum, right? And they both felt like the other person had it all wrong. Uh, I took that stuff and said, this is exactly what we need to be doing. So I thought, okay, okay, I've seen it, I got it, I got it from the ed school, this is good, I'm going to go out here, fix this whole thing, straighten it up. No, no, no. No, no, no. Uh, nothing is more difficult uh, than getting this system, which has no downside for failure, to change. Because there is no downside for failure. No one's weeping over those million kids in the South Bronx all the kids in Baltimore, all the kids in Camden, all the kids in South Central, and I could name 50 other places, uh, no one. Say, oh, what a shame, oh, what a shame, oh, what a shame. So I've come to the conclusion that the country is in real peril. This thing is not going to work. Uh, when this was only about a few poor black and brown kids, I could say it's immoral, unethical, but I wouldn't say it's going to undermine America, right? It's not about a few kids anymore. The data's out. The data's serious. You know, I'm reading on the Wall Street Journal, uh, front page article about the college uh, graduation rates of middle class students being 26% by the time they're 26 years old. I'm like, wait a second, that's not going to work. That's not going to work because we've got this, this innovation thing. People keep talking about these jobs. I don't know what you've been seeing, but I've seen no indication that we're going to have a bunch of low-skilled jobs in this country. I see no indication of this. I keep looking. I travel around the country. I go to the Midwest. I say, guys, you all see any sign that jobs are coming back here, that, you know, you don't need a high? And like, nope. I go out to the West Coast. I say, look, I know y'all you all see. No, I, where are these jobs coming from? They're not. And then I see stuff like this. So I'm giving a, a talk to Credit Suisse and uh, uh, about why, and I think business folks got to take this stuff seriously. I don't, I don't think people don't listen to those of us who are in education because they, like, you know, they brand you. You're one of the charter school people. You're, but folk who are outside of our general field, business leaders and others get involved in this, people listen to them differently, so I'm yelling at them. But when I, when I, I do a lot of yelling. So when, when I'm going, though, I'm going to park my car. Right, this is Midtown. So I pull up to the garage, and the guy stops me on the sidewalk. He says, okay, black guy, he says, uh, Jeff, Jeff, you know, my name. He says, wait, 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 right here. He said, you ever been here before? I said, no. He said, oh, you're going to love this. I said, okay, what? He said, pull in and just follow the signs uh, on uh, the front. So I pull into the parking bin. Big sign says, 
put your car in park, put on the emergency brake, take out your keys, lock your door, exit the area, stand behind the white line. So I do that, and I move back, I stand behind the white line, doors close, a rotary a set of uh, moving tracks come, picks up the pallet with my car on it, and carries it away. And I'm looking, I'm just watching. I'm like, wow, where did they take the car? So I go out and the guy these like, that was cool, wasn't it? I said, yeah. I said, let me ask you a question. How many people work here? He said, oh, just me. And I thought, yeah, next year they're not going to need you. Right? So I'm thinking, at the same time that's happening, I'm reading, it's on 60 Minutes. You can go see it. Google invents a car that needs no driver. And they're driving a car all over California. And I'm watching this on 60 Minutes. And there's a person in the car, because I'm sure it would freak everybody out to see a car with no drive. But, but they don't need the person. They don't need the person. The car obeys all the traffic laws. No one's driving it. It has all of these different uh, sort of uh, radar systems around it. It stays in line, and it goes through San Francisco, up and down those streets, the hills, all that. It's doing perfectly no accidents. And I said, oh, my goodness. Oh my goodness, you know what that means? All those taxi cab jobs, all those truck driver jobs. Imagine a truck that you don't have to take off the road for someone to sleep. No vacation, no sick days, runs 24 hours nonstop, never makes a mistake. How many people is that gonna put out of work? You know what Google's doing right now? They're investigating the legal ramifications of having an accident with a car with no driver. Because right, Google knows what's going to happen. Of course we're going to go that way. So I'm sitting here looking at technology and saying, this is great, but what does this mean for folk who don't have any education? Now, you might think, like I did, OK, Jeffy, I can see where that might be a problem for the country. Got millions and millions of people who aren't graduating high school, and then you have this huge number of folk who don't finish college, right? And what, what kind of jobs are they going to get? And I said, look, this, is, this will be a disaster for America. But the people who love this country, they have the answer to this. Right? They just haven't told me because it's you know, above my pay grade. That's not what I do. But you know what? Over the last six or seven years, I've met a few presidents, a few secretaries of education, a few secretaries of labor, some directors of domestic policy. They don't know what to do. They don't know what to do. Guess what happens when they see me? They say, Jeff, can we talk to you a second? What do you think we ought to do? I say, you're asking me? I'm trying to save my kids in Harlem. You guys are running the country. Y'all don't know? <laughs> Education is the social service equivalent of Katrina. Remember those pictures? Those people standing on those roofs thinking someone was coming? Signs held up, rescue, nobody's coming. Nobody. Uh, so we decided communities have to do this themselves. They have to do this themselves. We have to solve this stuff. And the question is, where is that leadership going to come from? Uh, this is no sort of easy task. Uh, this is not something that people are just going to sit down and figure out and everything's going to be fine. This is tough work. Uh, and we need a new generation of uh, educators and advocates uh, to spend time helping us with this. Now, look, I know that uh, some folk may be thinking, well, you know, Jeff, uh, you've made this sound pretty dire, but it's probably not that bad. Yes, it is. It's actually worse than most people uh, think, uh, because uh, people think this is a problem with black and brown kids. And it is not. Uh, it's as silly as I've heard in the uh, you know, debates, folk talking about food stamps and black people. <laughs> there are so many white people on food stamps today that they had to change the name. It's not called food. You know what it's called? Snap. You get a card. You get a card because when I was on welfare, they humiliated people. They wanted to make sure it was public humiliation. 
So they embarrassed you at every chance they got. They, now, there's so many Americans. You might know what the numbers are. It's staggering. But they can't embarrass people. They can't embarrass people about this. So this is going on. People still think this is one thing. Right? They still think this is about people who don't try hard, who don't work harder. And this is about something fundamental to our country. We are failing our young people across the board. Middle class, working class, poor kids. If you're not sending your kid to a prep school or one of those top 10 or 15 percent of the public schools that are doing a great job, there's a good chance your child is not going to finish college. And there's no place for them in this economy. So my thought is we got to have a new set of rules. They're simple for us. We think you rebuild community. You start with kids at birth. You stay with those kids until they graduate from college. We think this is about getting a college degree. You do scale. Right now, we've got 11,000 kids that we're working with. We plan for all of our kids to go to college. You hold yourself accountable. You use data. You trust evaluation, right? But in the end, educators have to be professionals. And I tell people this. I've taught for a living. Just because you want to teach does not make you a good teacher. You actually have to have some skills. Uh, and not everybody has skills. And people are mad at me around the country because I say, if you're a teacher and you cannot teach, you should take another job. You should get another career. And people are like, why is he beating up on teachers? I'm not beating up on teachers. But look, if I said you're a hairdresser and you're lousy, you should get another job. Nobody would think that was like, oh my goodness, look, he's beating up on hairdressers. No, you're not. No, you're not. You're just saying this is important and we need people who have a set of skills. We have so uh, sort of uh, degraded uh, what a teaching is that folk have thought anybody could do this. And it is simply not true. It's one of the most difficult and complicated jobs there is. And we need terrific people to help us do this. So uh, we believe in accountability. Uh, and let me tell you Harlem Children's Own Accountability. Uh, when I started my charter school, now I remember these schools in Harlem have been failing for 50 years. I said to my board, I said to my uh, mayor, and I said to my chancellor, if I don't have a better school in five years than all these other traditional public schools in Harlem, I'm going to fire myself. They wrote it down. They said, Jeff said five years, he's going to fire himself, right? Uh, when they left, I got my entire team there. I said, I just want you all to know I'm the last one leaving, all right? This is about real accountability. Uh, everybody, failure is not an option. Uh, if you want to be in education, you can't be prepared to accept failure. Uh, that's been the standard uh, in our industry uh, since uh, I was here in 75. Uh, and we decided that in the end, smart people using real science, uh, Roland Fryer was mentioned, I spent uh, some time with Roland this morning and his group at Ed Labs. They're looking at the science of this stuff. They want to be clear about, do we have some data and some evidence that this thing really works? And then that's what we have to do. Uh, so uh, I'd like to uh, uh, close uh, my talk, and I want to take some questions, but uh, I'd like to uh, close my talk with uh, poetry. And uh, this particular poem uh, is one uh, that I wrote uh, that really has to do with uh, this issue of accountability, which uh, is a real central issue uh, in the work that uh, I do. Uh, and I think that uh, for those of you who uh, kind of know uh, the uh, sort of ed reform controversies and, and folk who are in favor of charter schools and some folks who are in favor of public schools, we have 700 of our kids uh, in college. None of them went to my charter school, none. We make no distinction, no matter what school you go to, we think there's a set of supports to get those kids into college and get them through college. So we'll have our first graduating year uh, from our charter school this year. So we're not about simply one type of education. This is about making sure everybody has a great education. So uh, this poem that I wrote uh, is called Don't Blame Me, and uh, I'd like to close with this uh, poem. The girl's mother said, don't blame me. Her father left when she was three. I know she don't know her ABCs, her one, two, threes. But I am poor and work hard, you see. You know the story. 
It's don't blame me. The teacher shook her head and said, don't blame me. I know it's sad. He's 10, but if the truth be told, he reads like he was six years old. In math, don't ask. It's sad, you see. Wish I could do more, but it's after three. Blame the mom, blame society, blame the system, just don't blame me. The judge was angry, his expression cold. He scowled and said, son, you've been told, break the law again and you'll do time. Have you, you robbed with the gun? Have you lost your mind? The young man opened his mouth to beg, save your breath, he heard instead. Your daddy left when you were two. Your mama didn't take care of you. Your school prepared you for this fall. Can't read, can't write, can't spell at all. But you did the crime for all to see. You're going to jail, son. Don't blame me. If there is a God or a person supreme, a final reckoning for the kind and the mean, and judgment is rendered on who passed the buck, who blamed the victim, or who proudly stood up. You'll say to the world, while I couldn't save all, I did not let these children fall. By the thousands, I helped all I could see. No excuses. I took full responsibility. No matter if they were black or white, were cursed, ignored, were wrong or right, were shunned, prejudged, were short or tall, I did my best to save them all. Then I will bear witness for eternity that you can stay proudly. Don't blame me. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you. So I am. Uh, thank you very much. Please, I am uh, going to take some questions. I, I warn you, as I have warned uh, folks earlier today, I am very opinionated, right? So I believe very strongly in, in what I believe. I just may not be right. All right, so as long as y'all keep those caveats in mind, I'm happy there's mic set up. Please come to mic, introduce yourself. I'll take a question about anything. Who's gonna be first? Okay, great. Yeah, um, my name's Alex Smith. I'm a doctoral student here at, at the Ed School. My question is, I'm really inspired by your work and what's happened at Har Harlem Children's Zone. When I see it being brought out to the nation through the promised neighborhoods, they frankly look too watered down to me and too lean to do it. And I feel like it's almost a setup for it to fail there. I'm wondering what your thoughts are on scaling Harlem yep. Children's Zone. It's a great question. Uh, we decided that uh, this work is complicated uh, and difficult. Uh, and um, one of the challenges uh, in running a zone is most organizations struggle with running one good program. Right? So you get folks in the early childhood and you got a lot of variation, uh, a lot of programs are great, a lot of lousy. Uh, but to do a zone, you have to run 16 good programs, right? Uh, and so that complexity has uh, really bothered people. Uh, and uh, what I have said to folk is uh, that should not uh, prevent us from uh, learning the set of skills it's going to take to do this work. And it reminds me, uh, and again, this is an education issue. It reminds me, and this is the thing about being old, right? Uh, that I remember the first heart transplant, right? Did the transplant, person didn't live long, or maybe hours, maybe days. Uh, and there was only one person in the country who could do it. And the way people think about our work, everybody should have thrown up their hands and said, well, nobody else could do it, so probably. But you know that those transplants are routine all over America today. Uh, why? Because smart people got involved, learned the techniques, did what they needed to do. 
Running a zone is as complicated as running a good emergency room. Now, all of you know, every city, there are good emergency rooms and bad emergency rooms. And if you're knowledgeable, you're in Harlem, there's a word. Something happened to me, I know just, do not take me to such and such. I want to go here. Why? Because you know they have a great emergency room. But when you think about what it takes to run a great emergency room, first of all, you don't know what's walking in the door. Right? You better not be in one of those emergency rooms that the day you show up, right, the cardiac guy ain't there. Right? You're like, oh, my chest is, oh, you out of luck today. <laughs> I hope that's indigestion because uh, we don't, and, and you know, I say that, but that's, but that's what a zone is. It's getting the right elements, and it's not easy. So we set up something called the Promise Neighborhoods Institute, which when I was in Washington, D.C., we were meeting with all of the winners, the five communities that won with the technical supports for those communities. So it's a group called Policy Link uh, that is providing a direct technical assistance, the Promise Neighborhoods Institute is, and we are. And we think the three of us are going to try and surround these organizations with the support so they don't make the predictable errors, right, that we think people make in scaling. So we've got a lot of, I think, focus on this issue. We're not uh, taking this lightly and saying to people, go off and do this on your own. What we said is actually come in Study this, look at this, ask the questions, and then let us go along with you in developing some of this. I think the, the federal government putting up the resources, really half of them, really matters, and they're going to have to raise the other half of the money. So I think this is something we're going to be watching very closely. But I think you're right. We're very, very worried about replication. Right? As soon as we heard that, that they were going to uh, replicate this work, uh, we started planning on how we were going to support the groups that were going to do it. Please. I'm good. someone to watch do it um, uh, because I, I don't want to be in the classroom and I don't want to teach but I yep. know that I still want to be involved in kind of reshaping education yep. and through through programs like CSO or through you yep. know the different types of wraparound services that exist so I guess my question to you is what would that education look yep. like what who and and what are the skills that we would need in order to know how to run programs effectively um, because it's not question. necessarily something you know, that Hugsy can give us, or yep. that we can watch. It's a, it's a great question. Uh, and I have been blessed with these sort of uh, intellectual practitioners, right, who spend as much time and energy on practice as they did on theory. And I think it's an area that, that we've got to get better in. Uh, and my recommendation, and, and this is what I say to a lot of teachers uh, and folks who are interested in, in education reform, uh, it is incumbent upon you to research and find the places that are doing the best work and to one way or another get yourself in that door. Uh, and you spend money on your education and it might mean that you're going to take a huge pay cut to go someplace where they're actually doing this stuff. But there are people right now who are putting this stuff together on the ground and they are breaking through these barriers. Uh, the, uh, uh, issue when, when I uh, left uh, here, you get to be my age, they send you social security statements and they tell you how much you made every year you've worked, right? I was stunned. I was like, how did I live off of that? Uh, and not very well, right? Which was part of the issue. But what I learned, uh, you couldn't have, uh, I think, gotten anywhere else. Some of this is about practical experience uh, and I, I would go and volunteer. I would do what I had to do to get the knowledge because the knowledge is as real and as important as the knowledge you're getting right here. Uh, and I think that you've got to research, you've got to find that place that's doing great work, you've got to go in and talk yourself in to make sure you get in to learn that uh, because there is no substitute uh, than being on the ground and getting some of this work done. So that would be my recommendation. Uh, there are people who are doing it and they're busy, right? And they're going to be like, thank you very much. But no, you got to, this is something you're going to have to do for yourself. If you want to be on the cutting edge of this stuff, uh, I think you've got to go find the folk who are doing it right now and on the ground uh, and really uh, continue to work on this. I'll, I'll tell you the biggest challenge I find from folk after they finish at the university. 
they, unless they go into research, they don't want to research anything anymore. And I'm always stunned. It's like, I'm done with that, right? I passed that grade. I don't have to do that anymore. But I'm like, you're not studying your field. You're not seeing what people are doing in Indiana. and You're not, act no, they don't do that at all. So this idea that, you know, education ends here and it's not up to us to continue to pursue our education is a big myth. What you're supposed to learn is how to learn forever. And I was telling a group, I told them, one of the best things I am is I am good at learning what other people do well. And if I find something good, I, you will see it in the zone tomorrow. Uh, because I feel like, you know, why not go learn this stuff, right? And no, why not go find great people who are doing things and, and why should you reinvent the wheel? So I, my recommendation, go out there, right? Talk your way in uh, and get that knowledge. That's what I would say. Thank you. Great. Hi, I'm Shauna. I'm a little shorter than Alex. Um, and I'm a D2 here at the um, Ed School. I've got a question for you. You were really um, compelling about the system that supported your learning, this watch me do it. Um, and then when we talked about teachers, we talked about teachers being good quality, but it sounded like a really individual thing that you were lucky enough to be good quality. And if you weren't, we'll throw you out. So it's interesting to me that we talk about all of this support for kids to learn and the importance of learning when it comes to kids. But the language around teaching and accountability feels way more judgmental and less more, less educational. Um, and so I was really wondering sort of how, when you think about the promised neighborhoods, how you support the adults in learning, right? Because everybody can't go to Harvard yep. um, and get, and, and everybody who goes to Harvard doesn't leave with what you got. Yep. So how do we um, do a better job of creating systems to support adults so that we have the capacity to support kids? Because if we fire every bad teacher, we don't even have babysitters for kids, yep. Yep. right? I mean. Yep, so, so let, me, let me just, so let me, yeah, I think this is three or four questions in there, but I'm going to, Sorry. I'm going to, <laughs> I'm going to go after the heart of, uh, I think, one of the big ones, and then I'll, I'll come to the other one. Uh, one I said is we got to fire lousy teachers, and I, I'm not going to back off of that. You got to fire lousy teachers. This idea that you can be lousy and you get to stay, uh, it hurts poor kids more than any other concept that we have because those lousy teachers don't stay in good schools. They get rid of them. And where do you think they send all those lousy teachers? They send them to places where they can hide because nobody cares. And we know where those places are. So on this one, I didn't say mediocre teachers, right? I didn't even go after mediocre teachers. I said lousy, right? And lousy, yes, we got to get rid of them and we got to get them out the door. So people take that as me being judgmental about teachers. But no one would take that if I said we got to get rid of lousy lawyers. No one. There's no one say, oh, look, Jeff's beating up on lawyers. And then we get rid of lousy doctors. No one says, oh, my goodness, look, Jeff's beating up on lousy, lousy taxi cab drivers. Got to get rid of them, too. So why is it about teaching that when we say that, people feel like you're attacking teachers? Now, that, that's not what you said. I know. See, she was like, see, he heard me wrong. No, I heard you right. But I wanted, but other people heard that statement. And that's, what I, that's what's been happening. That's what uh, the folks have decided is the message from waiting for Superman and other things is that we're beating up on teachers. And that's not it at all. So that's the first thing. But the question you really asked was, where are the supports to actually improve the teaching and learning for teachers so they can become more effective? That's really what you were asking. Uh, and I think that uh, one of the challenges we have in our whole field is that we are tilted towards the theory and there's very little opportunity to get good practice where teachers might end up. And I was, I was at another uh, 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 place this morning and, I, and this is just a true story. Uh, here when I was at Harvard, no one prepared me what to do the first time a kid called me a motherfucker in a classroom, right? So I'm in the classroom, that's what the kid said. It wasn't on a syllabus anywhere, right? <laughs> right? Now, anyone who's taught knows that this is a seminal moment in a classroom because all the students are watching you and they're saying, oh, and they're really looking like, and now what is this person going to do? And if you lose it, you're liable to lose that class, right? Now, the schools, they want to take you for teacher training, that is not going to happen, right? That is not going to happen. So we protect students from experiences like that. 
which sometimes doesn't help them get the skill set of managing behavior and other things inside a real setting. You know, one of the, the big problems we had, uh, so we, we have all this knowledge about hiring good teachers, and we're still, teachers are washing out, and we're like, what are we doing wrong? We bring them in, they have the credentials. You know what we were doing wrong? We bring the teachers in, everybody want to see them. They say, oh, we got a new teacher, we really like him. I say, great, 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 let me come. So in comes the principal, the dean, the assistant principal, everybody comes in the classroom, they're all watching. What do you think the kids are doing? The kids are like this. Yes, I know the answer to that, right? That's not how our kids act, but you got the whole administration in there. So you know what we had to say? That doesn't give a fair idea. You come to work in Harlem, you're going to have kids with behavior problems. If you can't manage that, this is not the school to come to. I right, see so what we had to do. We had to tell a couple of kids. I shouldn't tell some of you maybe come looking for teaching jobs. You don't know. But I, I tell a couple of kids, y'all got to act out. They said, with everybody? Yeah. Let me, don't, don't pay attention. Talking, let me see what happens. Let's see what a person really does in real life so that they get some sense of how you can manage for real. Because some of it is so artificial, it's not, it doesn't reflect reality. So I think, see, if you've never been in that situation before, if no one's helped you, if no one's guided you, if no one, then there's a very, it's very difficult for folk to come into these situations and know how to manage a classroom. You bring me in any class, because of those early experiences I had, behavior and other, in no time at all, I got that class under control. That's a set of skills, there's a science to that, which is often divorced from education, which I think is a problem. So there needs to be a place to do that. Let me tell you the reason it won't happen with practitioners. Why, why it won't happen at the Harlem Children's Own Promise Academy, KIPP Academy, other places. Everybody there is running so fast, they don't have time to worry about, uh, can I spend an extra four, or five, or six months preparing folks like this? The one thing KIPP did was they started their own teacher training school. They just said, you know, we got to, after they know everything else, they got now got to know what it's like in the hood to get this stuff done. And so we're going to spend some time doing that. And I think we're going to have to have more experiences where uh, things happen here and then you really get the knowledge on the ground. I was able to really get the knowledge on the ground. And the, the reason for those stories is I think we need more of that, not less. Right? We need more opportunities for folks to come in with great skills and see what it looks like for real uh, in real life. So I, I think it's a great point. Yes. Hi, my name is Aditi. I'm a student at the Kennedy School. Um, first, thank you so much for such an inspiring talk and being a role model to so many of us. Um, I wanted, so my interest is in international education and specifically in India, um, working at a very grassroots level with mm. the, the poorest of the poor. And so I wanted to share a statistic only because um, when I share it to economists that I work with who think about these things all the time, it even shocks them, um, and which is that if you take a look at the bottom income quintile in India, which by itself is large enough to be the fourth or fifth largest country in the world, and that bottom income quintile, if you look at the median years of education for a teenage girl, so 15 to 19, the median years of education is one. And for boys, um, it's six. So that difference is, the number is low and the, the gap is also really big. Um, and something I believe, which has been so inspiring to hear you echo, is how much there is a science to working on mobilizing the community. But if you just had to give some comments based on all your experience working with the community in the Harlem Children's Zone, in that context, it seems like you can't do anything unless you work with the community well first. Um, and, and so just how, yeah. how, what advice would you give to anybody that's, that's struggling with that magnitude of barriers? Yep. So that's a, that's a great question. And uh, I, when I was here, they really taught international education, which was I didn't take the class. So I'm not by any means an expert on it. But let me tell you what we did, what we found in Harlem, because I think we were dealing with not as severe a gap in some ways, but the same thing. There were a set of child-rearing principles which ran counter to the science, right? The science said parents ought to be doing these kinds of things with their infants, and the practice was parents were doing these other kinds of things. So in uh, my culture, people thought uh, good kids were quiet kids, kids who didn't ask questions, kids who didn't talk back. Uh, that was a good kid. All of the science said, you need those kids deeply engaged in questioning and asking. So I'm looking at this mismatch and saying, the parents I have uh, don't know anything about this science. So then we began to teach parents the science. But here was the problem. You'd go in and say, OK, look, it's great that the kid asked that question. And when they asked the second question, and I know when they said, well, how come I can't, 
that your response is usually because I'm your mother, sit down and do what I told you. But that's the wrong response. We want you to say, honey, let me tell you three different reasons that I think this is a problem. <laughs> you know how this went over with the grandmothers? <laughs> they were looking and say, what? did you hear the way that kid just talked to you? Why are you? So here we thought, right, you, you could solve this by dealing with one generation, but it became a two generation problem because even if you believe Jeff, when you went around your cousins, your aunts, your gra they said, what are you doing? You're gonna ruin that kid. I don't care what them crazy people at the Harlem Children's Zone told you, right? So we had to begin to open this conversation up to more people. So now we got a grandparents thing in there, right? Because when you begin to pull on this thread, you begin to say, oh, you know what? It's taking me a little deeper in this than I thought. Uh, the problem in a place that's overwhelming is that you don't know where to begin. Uh, and we started on one block. And what we said is, we was going to get this right. And we're going to get it right in a small place. Before we, before we had 97 blocks, we had one block. Uh, and Harlem is much bigger than 97 blocks, right? But the issue was, could we come up and solve the problems in real time for real people? So when you can do it with a 1,000 folk, then maybe you have an answer what you're going to do with 10,000 and maybe 100,000, maybe 500,000. We didn't know the government was going to come in and say replicate this work. We were just trying to solve the problem. Uh, the tendency when it's overwhelming like this is to try and do everything and end up doing nothing. Uh, so I would say uh, in, in this practice, you'll find out some stuff we tried simply did not work. Uh, we were trying to get parents to come to baby college, right? It's free class. Dr. Barry Brazelton was our expert on this. It was great. Nobody was coming. Nobody was coming. I was like, but, but this is free. And it's, it's seven Saturdays. So here you're overwhelmed, mom. You got three kids. We're going to take your Saturday mornings and say, come. So they didn't want to come. So I said to my team, I said, look, guys, uh, what would get you there? I said, so here, you're, you're 20, right? Do you have any money? Uh, I'm offering this free class. What could we offer to get you there? You know what they came up with? Pampers. They said, oh, Pampers, Pampers, gonna do Pampers. Okay, great. So we said, give free Pampers. Come to Saturday Baby College. We did free Pampers, and I got the data for the next week. And I said, how did it work? They said, it was great, it was great. I said, how many parents came? They said, we had seven. I said, that doesn't sound so great. We, had seven. we gave free Pampers? We had seven people? I thought you said it was great. They said, yeah, we got to see. I said, let me see. Uh, the signs that you hung them up in the nail places, yes, in the laundromats, yes, in the, in the, the, the supermarket, we put them in all those places. No one can. So I got the sign. Uh, Leafless said, Do you want to be a better parent? Uh, do you want to know how to uh, properly prepare your child for an education? Uh, would you learn uh, the, the eight things that are. And, and at the very bottom, right, it said free pampers. I said, Anybody who could read all of this doesn't even need to work with us, right? <laughs> I said, I don't care what you write in the body. I want two inch block letters, free pampers at the top. You know what happened the next week? Fill to overflowing, right? Fill to overflowing. So some of this is solving things, right? Small, right? Just small, just going and getting it done. If hey, people don't show up, I can't even teach them anything. How do I get the people to show up? So we didn't, we didn't worry about could we work with 100,000 folks. I just wanted to get those folks on that block engaged and involved to test this out. So I would just recommend for you uh, that this is the same thing. You got a set of beliefs around children, a real belief about what girls should be doing, what boys should be doing. Simply telling folk that's wrong is not going to work. It's a lot more complicated and sophisticated than that is. But we ran into a lot of those same obstacles also. And we kept pulling on it until we began to tease some of this stuff out. And so that would be my recommendation. Oh, sorry, you got a last question. All right, right here. Thank you so much for coming today. I'm a master's student in the higher education cohort, and I have two questions about collaborations. Yep. One is, as a higher ed administrator, I'm interested to know if a group of us came to you today and said, what are some of the collaborative efforts we can work on to not only help get kids into college, but persist? What would those be? And also, at the K-12 level, what conditions and steps do you see are necessary to ease the tension between public schools and yeah. charter schools so yeah. that you can work together yeah. and produce better education? It's, it's great. I mean, those are both great questions. Uh, I'm sorry they did say it was the last question, I know. Uh, but that was the dean, it wasn't me, so don't be mad at me on this. Right? I see how quickly I threw the dean under the bus. Right? That was terrible, right? That was terrible. Uh, so so uh, this, uh, 
this issue about collaboration and kids going to college. Uh, this is a huge, huge scandal in my opinion, right? Uh, you've got huge numbers of kids, mostly disadvantaged, going to college. Uh, they need remedial work. They use their college loans and their tuition, Pell Grants, and other things to pay for the remedial work. They get no cost credit for it. Immediately when that stuff is over, kids end up failing out of school. So he took a poor kid. They borrowed $5,000 to go to college. They got nothing but $5,000 in debt. So they're starting out with more debt than their parents have right, right from the beginning. This is happening to hundreds of thousands, millions of kids, uh, and uh, we, can, we can figure out a lot of this stuff better than this. So this is what we believe. Uh, we think, first of all, you got to get the kids prepared so they don't have to take the tutorials. And you got to start with juniors and seniors to get that done. So there's the collaboration. Can you get folk to work with, and usually uh, it's math and English are usually the two stumbling blocks for kids in terms of them having to take remedial classes. And this is going to take, it's going to take some time. This is not something that you're going to come in the summer of their senior year and get them prepared. Uh, someone has to look into those sophomore, juniors, and seniors and get those kids working on those set of skills so that they can get enough support to make it into college. The second thing is a lot of kids make the same mistakes uh, when they go to school. Uh, and I was talking, you know, uh, uh, a lot of my kids, uh, they had never been away. Uh, they were in, you choose your own classes when you go to college, right? Now, what classes do you choose, right? You want to be smart, right? So you're liable to choose a bunch of classes that you are totally unprepared for. Uh, and there is nothing worse than first semester uh, ending up failing a bunch of classes because no one told you those classes, you should wait till you're a sophomore or a junior to take those classes. So we don't have a good advising system for kids, right? And if you were at, you know, I was at Bowdoin, pretty good school. Uh, we had folk up at Bowdoin who were not really able to academically perform at the highest level. They played certain sports. We're not going to get into it right now. <laughs> there was a system to help those kids get through Bowdoin, right? There was a system. People don't go, don't, don't you take so and so's class. You stay away from that. You have to go over here. Right? So if you can do that for them, how do other kids learn how to negotiate their way and figure out when you should take advanced classes? So our kids come in not knowing an awful lot. Uh, so that's another thing. Is there an advising system? If you know a kid is going uh, to, uh, you know, the uh, UMass. Uh, and you know the subject material at UMass, you can tell those kids, these are great classes. Look, you're interested uh, in uh, being a doctor, great, but don't take chemistry, right, and calculus your first semester freshman year, right? That's a recipe for disaster unless you came from a prep school that you took advanced placement classes in those areas. So this kind of stuff is really basic, but most of the kids going in don't know it. The last thing I'll tell you is that there are lots of uh, time management issues that kids don't know anything about. They just don't know. Uh, I meet with all of my seniors. We have something we call a senior seminar. So I bring them in and I ask them things about how long they study, how much study time they do. And they think I'm talking about homework. I'm like, no, no, I'm not talking about homework. I'm talking about study. After your homework is done, that you actually study. And they were pretty honest, not much. And I told them, you know, uh, no one's going to be there to tell you how much you should study. And how much should you study if you're taking uh, Sociology 101, right? You're 18. You don't know unless you've been prepared for that. So these kids don't know anything about those kind of things, and they make very predictable errors, right? Uh, and it's a problem. Uh, kids from the inner city, I tell my kids, when you go to school, you want to be around kids that you feel comfortable with, right? These are not going to be the kids going into the library, right? That's not who my kids are going to seek out, right? They're going to go look for kids who are socially similar, usually ethnically similar. Uh, and uh, if you don't meet kids whose first priorities are studying, right, preparation, but kids whose first priorities are let's go hang out, let's see what's then you're going to end up drifting into trouble. Very predictable, 
Uh, no one's there to help kids figure that stuff out. The kids get in trouble their first year and end up uh, sort of owing money and not able to go back to school. So some of this I think we can work out uh, and we can do a better job. Uh, I'm sorry, there's another uh, reception I have to go to afterwards, so I know people had some questions. I'm sorry about that, but thank you all very thank much. You so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.